some of this might be review um, if you learned areas of light and shadow in another class at some point in time. But this is a graphic that you'll see if you just look up value or value sketches or value studies, um, you know, value exercises. Value, as I've talked about in the past few semesters, is a really um, important part of creating paintings, whether you're working with representation or abstraction. Um, you know, it creates this illusion of light and shadow in our paintings. And um, again, if you're working with non-objective subject matter, you know, the lights and the darks can also start to create this feeling that light exists in a painting or that this is an open space um, inside of your picture plane. And when we're looking, when we're thinking about objects or forms um, that we're trying to convey or trying to um, translate into a two-dimensional space, we have to be mindful of the way that light describes that form. And a lot of this happens through the construction or the system of values that are organizing our understanding of that form from one angle or from one perspective. So all of these are going to be photographs that are showing uh, kind of like the anatomy of light and shadow when we think of a form. So the first thing is the highlight. Typically, the highlight is the brightest value on your form or your object that is being illuminated sphere. The highlight is right in this area here, right? So if you're painting a portrait or you're painting um, something that's a little bit more um, organic in form, try to find where the highlight is first. And that can give you your gauge of how bright your values are going to become in your form or in your painting, if you're trying to make it true to life and you're trying to match the colors. The next thing is the center light, which is the like local highlight of the color on the object itself. So on this sphere, this area here is going to give us a value and a color that sits within our center light of the form. And a lot of this is where the light is bouncing off of the form and reflecting back from the light source. What we're finding is that the value slowly starts to come down, right? We get to a point where the value kind of hits this line right around here and it starts to become a little bit darker. That is what we're calling the half tone. And the half tone exists also within an area of space where, in general, you can simplify it into one main value, right? Kind of in this zone here. And if we had a value scale pulled up, we could say this is probably value, you know, eight or nine, if we have a 10 value scale and 10 being white, right? So we go from technically from right to left here, center light, the highlight, the brightest point into the half tone. And then we reach an area that is called the terminator. And this is where the object moves from being illuminated to being in shadow, right? So this whole dark line here. And what you'll notice is that it's not only is it a lot darker than the half tone, but it's also a lot darker than the core of the shadow, which is going to be this whole space all around here, right? All the way up here, all the way over to this side over here. Basically, this zone is our core of the shadow. The terminator is the dark, so, like sometimes it's pretty subtle, but this slightly darker value that separates the half tone from the core of the shadow. So right along here, and it ends up being a pretty straight line when we're looking at a sphere. Up above the core of the shadow, we have an area called, that in this example is called reflected light. So it doesn't always mean it's going to be in this part of the sphere, but in general, forms will have some evidence of reflected light. And this is talking about the local color of the object versus the color of the environment that is reflected onto that object. Now, this color in here is coming from light that is bouncing from the light source, hitting the plane, the table plane, that is where the sphere is located, bouncing off that table towards the object, 
right? So we, it's not going to be the high light because it's not light directly coming from the light source. It's light that is already hitting the, um, the ground plane or whatever the object is sitting on or sitting close to. Some of that light is being absorbed into the ground plane. And the, whatever's left is reflecting off of that ground plane and hitting the object. And that's creating this reflected light. Now, if this plane was blue or green or yellow, chances are that the hue of that surface, this plane is also going to reflect on the object. So if you're studying something from life and you look long enough, a lot of times you'll start to find these very subtle shifts in hue or temperature and the color of the object. And that's typically because of the environment that the object is in. Now, why this concept is super important is if you're going into character design or illustration and you're going to portray subjects or moments or narratives that are from your imagination, if you want them to feel believable and realistic, these are things that you're going to have to think about. You're going to have to think about the process of light hitting forms or objects and what that light does to describe that form. Then we have the darkest value when we're looking at an illuminated object, which is called the occlusion shadow. So we can see it's pointing to this really, really dark spot where the form meets the plane that it's sitting on. And that basically is telling us where there is absolutely zero light that is describing that area of space. And we have the absence of light, which is going to be black or really, really dark, a really, really dark color. And then last but not least, we have the cast shadow. This is the shadow that is created by the light source on the plane or the surrounding environment um, where the object is sitting or where our subject is sitting. So um, when you're studying something and it's a three-dimensional form, you don't have to necessarily think about all of these different areas of the anatomy, but I think it definitely will help to start to think about the effects of light on that form and how light is describing that form, where the cast shadow direction is going. Sometimes what helps me if I'm painting, um, especially in plein air, is to start to look at the shadows of cars or of buildings and think about the direction that that shadow is going. A lot of times you'll be able to then figure out where the light source is coming from to create a shadow that's moving that direction. Now, let's say the shadow in this picture uh, oops, was moving in this direction. You know, if the shadow, let's say the shadow was going over here, what would we start to think about the light source? You know, it would be in a different position, right? If this was our cast shadow moving over in this direction, we would assume then that the light source is coming in from this direction over here. Maybe it's hitting the form more in this position. This is where the highlight would be then. Right, so a lot of times to, to determine where the light source or the direction of the light is hitting the object, it helps to look at the direction of the um, shadow first. Okay, um, the other thing to think about is the planar structure of the form. And um, these graphics are really helpful in thinking about value and thinking about how light describes the form through an arrangement of transitions between values, right? So when we take a sphere and we kind of carve it into this more geometric blocky um, shape, what we have are these really broad, flat areas of value shifts, right? It's really simple and easy to see the way that light starts to slowly become um, uh, diminished by the receding planes, right? By the way that the form wraps away from the light source. And as it does, those planes get darker and darker. But a lot of times we still have to think about the way that light is reflecting from the environment of the object and treating the object with subtle variations of light and shadow. Um, as the object gets smoother, those transitions are a lot more nuanced and subtle. 
between light and dark, right? So, you know, just jumping between these two slides, we can see that these jumps between values are a lot less noticeable, right? But we know that they're getting darker as they reach this terminator line here on the sphere. Um, and then looking at an object that, you know, is more organic and maybe not perfectly um, circular, you know, we can still identify some of those concepts here. So we have our highlight here, right? And it's a little bit harder to tell the way that the values are moving on this form here because it's not white, right? It's not quite as reflective. It's not quite as smooth. It has a local value. It has a local color. This orange is kind of a middle value. But right away, we can start to pick apart areas of divisions where value shifts are happening, right? There are these big areas where the light moves from light to dark. And we can start to identify values that will help us to describe this form, right? So we have our highlight. We have this sort of base halftone color here. The value slowly starts to get darker. This light source is up really high. So it's hitting from this angle. So that means that this bottom half of the sphere, you know, if we cut this on a hemisphere, is away from the light source. So it starts to get darker as we near the bottom of the orange or this tangerine. This area is our occlusion shadow here. So that's our darkest value in the picture plane. And um, if we look really closely, we can see very subtle reflected light on the very edge of the orange over on that left side of the orange. And that's light that's coming off of the paper where the light is bouncing. It's kind of coming down in this direction, bouncing off the paper and hitting the orange. So when you're looking at an object, really try to think of those very subtle shifts of value um, and what that value then is doing to the color. You know, the area in terms of chroma that are highest are in this part of the orange, right? This is the most illuminated part. The most light is hitting this area of the object. So the color is reflecting at its brightest, most powerful level. We have some chroma, even though we're in a shadow down here on the lower part of the tangerine. And um, otherwise, everything else is more in a, in a muted kind of grayish, greenish, orange mixture of colors. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is even when we look at a cast shadow, we have variety in value, right? We have a very kind of hard edge around the object that's a bit easier to find. It's a bit harsher, clearer around in this shape here. But when I outline that, we still have a little bit of extra shadow on the left side, right? So there's this like gradual, subtle softening of the edge on the shadow. Um, most forms have these levels of value that move. The other thing we'll notice is that if we look at this relationship here between the object and the shadow, it almost appears like the value gets a little bit brighter than it is along this edge on the rim of the shadow. So the longer we look, the more we start to find these very subtle shifts in what's happening with the color and the value. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that depending on the local color of the object. So this the local color of this object is orange, right? There are times where the local color of the orange or the object is going to reflect onto the environment. And in this case, it's happening here where the shadow is hitting the paper that the orange is sitting on. So this shape here on the orange is the reflection of the shadow this curve of the shadow reflecting up onto the orange. And then if we look really closely, you can see a slight orange hue to this part of the shadow in the front. So if you're following along right now, I'm gonna clear this and focus on this part of the shadow and see if you can notice that orange subtle hue as opposed to the rest of the shadow. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about matching colors or finding that 
subtlety of uh, color property in an object like this, those are things to really think about. Once you've figured out the form of the object, once you know that you have this um, spherical object, you have a good sense of the way that that form kind of sits in space. You know, you've sort of figured out the anatomy of the object through drawing, you know, where the highlight's going to go. You have some of these details of the object. You can start to get into the different plane shifts that happen through light and dark. And that really doesn't pertain to the, um, the color properties, but more so to the value of that object. And that's usually, this is usually why I start with value in my classes is because, you know, color is a, a whole, you know, area or element within art that has a lot of variability. There's a lot of factors that go into portraying color and using color. And um, if, especially if you want to work within representation and you want to paint things that feel dimensional, you want it to feel like there's space in your painting, value is going to be the thing that really helps to describe light and space. Um, so having a good understanding of the values is really, really important first. Um, you know, and drawing is going to be really important if painting representation is something that you want to do. So, all right. So the first thing I did was mix up a few piles of an orange hue. Um, I had three different values of orange. One was a little bit more brown and earthy. That became my core shadow color. Um, and I really thinned out the paint and used that to block in my initial circle and those larger plane shifts. From there, I started working into those mid values to create the reflected light on the lower portion of the orange and then slowly into the center light of the orange and building up the chroma um, using very thin amounts of paint and medium initially helped to let the paint glide on the surface and block in a lot of these larger passages. And then with a brush that was semi-dry, I would try to wipe off excess paint. I would feather out those edges of the transitions to create softer blends from darker areas to lighter areas. Initially, it felt a little subdued until I added in a cool background color in the demo. Um, once I added in that blue lighter value, that really helped to pop the orange warmth of the, um, of the subject. And then I could start to focus on my, my cast shadow and really start to find the nuances between the values, but also in the slight warmish brown uh, hue that was being reflected off of the tabletop surface. Um, and at this point, I was just kind of bouncing around the painting, trying to make sure that I was applying the appropriate jumps in value or in chroma um, while maintaining a focus on the quality of the edges of my shapes. And I realized about halfway through the demo that if I kept my edges really, really soft, it made the object feel a lot more volumetric. It made the space of the demo painting feel a lot more atmospheric. So when you're painting something like this, especially if you're working with acrylic, um, but also with oils, really be mindful of your, your character in your edges of your shapes and how that's helping to create this illusion of volume or of depth. Um, looking back, I realized that the value of that reflected um, light that's bouncing on the lower portion of the orange above the occlusion shadow there is a little bit too bright. So if I was going to fix that and go back into the painting, um, I would make that transition a little bit smoother and a little bit darker. Um, but overall, I think it's, it ended up being a pretty good demo to show the various planar shifts of the sphere of this orange. Um, and it definitely helped me to remember how important it is to think about those transitions between color properties. And a lot of times that jump is very, very subtle between shadow and light. Um, and starting with thinner or um, smaller amounts of paint allows you to really kind of test out different approaches and spend a lot of time in kind of a trial and error mode.
while you're working, which I think is really, really helpful. Um, so if you're going to be working either from a photograph like I was here or from life, um, definitely keep that in mind that the amount of paint you're using might be helping or um, hindering the process. So that pretty much wraps up the demo. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks so much for watching. Um, have a nice day. Thank mm -hmm. you.